Welcome to a discussion on Alexander G. Clark of Muscatine, Iowa. I'm Kent Sissel. I'm Dan Clark. And we're going to have a conversation similar to the types of conversations we've had on Dan's radio program that is aired on KWPC Tuesday mornings. Except that I'm not used to being watched when we do those. Well, that's really true. But on the other hand, we have visual images that we're able to show you, and I think that it will help explain the story of Alexander Clark. One of my concerns dealing with the history of Alexander Clark is that he changed his profession, his career, so many times during uh, his, his lifetime that there are thousands of pieces of information that we still haven't even found. For example, most people think that Alexander Clark, when he came to Muscatine in 1842, started a barber shop. The reality is he was 16 years old, and when he first came to Muscatine, according to a Muscatine Journey Journal article in June or April of 1842, he was selling fried, or a dried fruit in a grocery store on 2nd Street. That's an example of how we find bits of pieces of Alexander Clark all over the country. And eventually, perhaps, in our lifetime or after our lifetime, the complete history of Alexander Clark might be written. Dan's going to explain a little bit about the images that we have to look at, and, and then we're, this is just a casual conversation. Well, Kent, the slides I've prepared, uh, this is a work in progress we started in the year 2006, and uh, it's not updated nearly as much as I would like now, but you'll be pleased to know that I do include the word grocer. I'm glad. I think it's an important piece of information to know. Actually, the first barber in Muscatine was Thomas Motts, who arrived several years before Alexander Clark and had a thriving business. Considering that the population of Muscatine was not all that large at the time, it's a little difficult to understand that there might have been three or four barbers. Let's mention that Muscatine on the banks of the Mississippi River, uh, now the Iowa Shore, is in what was known as the West in those days. And the slides will take us back to 1836 when the town of Muscatine was founded. The first slide I'd like to put on the screen is uh, zooms in, though, on the neighborhood where Alexander Clark lived. You, you mentioned that he came in 1842, and uh, soon after he was able to buy a house. He, he had some means, and so here we see a map from 1883, the earliest uh, Sanborn fire insurance map we have that shows a close-up of the intersection of West 3rd Street and Chestnut Street. Uh, Chestnut was a main street coming up from the river in those days, and so uh, he was able to buy a house right at an important corner there in town. Other locations I've identified, if you can see the, in the words in red, it says hotel above, and that's known today as the Welch Apartments at the corner of West 3rd and uh, Iowa Avenue. That's the Scott House. The, the Scott House Hotel was there in the 1850s. And then it says Congregational Church down there, and we'll be talking more about that. Sure. Uh, the Congregational Church that was first built on that corner in 1852. I'm not sure whether you have photographs of the move of, of the Alexander Clark House. I have one or two, so let's uh, keep moving forward on the slides. We're, we're talking to the guys in the studio here, and they put the slides sure. up, and uh, th there we go. To, oh, we're going backwards. Let's go the other way. Just a, just a comment about the house. The original house that Alexander Clark bought, he purchased when he was 22 years old. Uh, and it would appear from records that I've located that the original house, which was a frame house, was very similar to the, the red brick house that exists today. It may, in fact, have been almost a 20-room house. Uh, it's, uh, that's unusual for, for a 22-year-old free black man to purchase. And the, uh, the slide that uh, was on the screen there showed the footprint of the house. That's the house that exists today. That was built in 1878, and we'll, uh, we'll get back to that. There you can see that. That was the 1892 map. And by the way, Alexander Clark was born in 1826 and died in 1891 uh, in Liberia, West Africa, where he was the United States ambassador. In 1892, his body came back uh, for burial here in Muscatine, and so uh, it's appropriate that we do have a map from that very year. Uh, let's go forward with the slides. Next slide, guys. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Uh, I talked about the early days. Muscatine was in the West. Uh, Muscatine was first named Bloomington, platted in 1836. Uh, so uh, as we go forward here, we have a bit of a timeline. Uh, 1838, Iowa becomes a territory. So in 1836, when the town began, uh, this area was actually part of the Wisconsin Territory and it had been Mich Michigan Territory also. Uh, the territorial legislature, uh, from the very start, adopted exclusion laws which limited the rights of blacks and mulattoes. Uh, 
1839, the Iowa Territory limits the number of black immigrants that could come in. Next slide. Uh, 1839, the Iowa Supreme Court, on the other hand, rules no man in this territory can be reduced to slavery, thus allowing a former Missouri slave named Ralph to remain in Iowa as a free man. And the image on the screen was uh, one of the symbols that the abolition movement, uh, black and white, both uh, were using at the time. Am I not a man and a brother, it says. Next. Uh, 1843, 11 young congregational ministers known as the Iowa Band come from Iowa to Massachusetts. They were all graduates of the same uh, class in seminary. They are abolitionists determined to make Iowa Territory a free state. Settling in Bloomington, now Muscatine, Brighton, Burlington, Davenport, Denmark, that's way southeast Iowa, down in the corner, uh, Farmington, Kiasakwa, Makokata, and Tipton. They start churches and they establish Iowa College at Davenport. Now that Iowa College was later moved to Grinnell and renamed Grinnell College. Most of these pastors, if not all of them, are active in anti-slavery societies and the Underground Railroad. Just a comment about the, the uh, picture that you've got included here, the, the engraving. Uh, let's go back to that if we can. Uh, that is actually uh, from an 1855 uh, copy of Ballou's pictorial published in, in Boston. And we'll show it again. We will show it yes. again. Uh, when we talk about the streets, or can I talk about streets now? The image, the image shows you the, the Congregational Church, the, the second building of the Congregational Church. And when we go back to the Oh image, yes, we, we do come to the, building, the different buildings of the church. It, and when we get back to that, we'll be able to point out to you how the streets of Muscatine were graded down. The church is right in the center with a tall spire, and it's actually sitting on a, on a large uh, chunk of ground when the streets were, were graded in 1856, the, church, the front entrance of the church was left 12 feet above grade level, the street level. And we'll, we'll point out that that church spire you see on the screen is right at the intersection of West 3rd and Chestnut. The other large building front and center uh, was known recently as Smargy and uh, it was uh, 1851 Oatmeal Factory. And so it was already there when this picture was made in 1855. Uh, next slide. In 1844, the uh, Iowa band member Alden Burl Robbins becomes the pastor of the local congregational church here in Muscatine and serves 50 years. Uh, that church is now Faith United Church of Christ out on Mulberry Avenue. Their bell comes by wagon from Boston in 1848. That bell is uh, under a, a, its own structure that you can see today at Faith United Church of Christ. Next. 1846, Iowa becomes a state. Paired with Florida, according to the, uh, the Missouri Compromise that had been uh, in effect for about 25, 26 years, at that point, the idea was that uh, northern states or, or free states uh, were not wanting the expansion of slavery. The slave states were not wanting more states to come into the Union where it was not possible to own slaves. And so the Missouri Compromise said the states have to come into the Union in pairs. So Iowa and Florida together. 1846 to 48 was the Mexican War that uh, had a lot to do with uh, the immigration pattern and the, and the feelings of the nation. 1847, Dred Scott first sues for his freedom. We'll come back to Dred Scott. That was a, famo a famous, uh, ultimately, Supreme Court case. The map on the right shows you Iowa in 1846 when it became a state. So you see the counties that were laid out were in the eastern half, and, or eastern third, southeastern third, and, uh, and the population, of course, was mostly along the river. Next. 1848, uh, Alexander, and we, we put the headline on here, Underground Railroad, 1848. Alexander Clark helps Jim White escape from agents attempting to return him to slavery in St. Louis. Uh, Jim's uh, owner, uh, who was a friend of Dred Scott's owner, had retired to rural Muscatine County and transferred Jim to a daughter in St. Louis. Court proceedings result in a decision that frees Jim White and is viewed as Iowa's rebuff to the National Fugitive Slave Law. The judge, uh, who, who finally ruled Jim White a free man, S.C. Hastings, later becomes California's first chief justice. Anything else about that, Ken? Well, one Jim of, White case? One of the interesting uh, articles we've, we've uh, been playing with recently is, an art, another, again, another Muscatine Journal article, and I believe it was uh, published in 1883 that quotes uh, uh, J.P. Walton as saying that uh, in 1840, um, 
647 uh, Alexander Clark along with a Mrs. S. H. Hughes uh, protected Jim White and worked together for his um, a freedom. At, at this point, we do not know who Mrs. S. H. Hughes is. And we'd love to learn about her. If anybody has a clue, let us know. Next slide. Uh, 1848 again, Alexander Clark marries Catherine Griffin of Iowa City. Uh, well, she has arrived in Iowa City. Uh, because of Iowa's exclusion laws that were in place, Alexander has to pay a $500 bond for his wife, even though she's a free black person. Any comment on that? Ken? Well, the, we, many of us have talked about the idea of the menu minutes um, uh, um, necessity that a bond, even for a freed black person, there needed to be a bond to guarantee that that person, and it, I believe it was ordinarily around $500, which was a tremendous amount of money in that time. To get, the bond was to guarantee that the individual did not ever become a, uh, a worry to the city or to the county and should never create any expense, that they had to be completely self-supportive. Uh, I do not believe that Alexander Clark was, was required to um, have such a bond. Uh, perhaps because of people he knew in Muscatine. But on the other hand, Thomas Motts, who was an extremely wealthy uh, individual when he came, and, w and one of the wealthiest uh, uh, residents in the city of Muscatine uh, at a later date, uh, did have to post a bond, a $500 bond, to, to remain in the state of Iowa. Let's return to that slide. Uh, 1853, Alexander Clark attends a colored people's convention in New York State, and first meets the uh, the great white or the great colored orator, as he was called, Frederick Douglass, uh, the escaped slave who who became a, a writer and uh, and uh, leader and perhaps uh, best known black man in 20, in nineteenth uh, century America, and uh, so they were acquainted from at least eighteen fifty three. In eighteen ninety, President Benjamin Harrison will appoint both men as U.S. ambassadors. Douglas to Haiti, or actually that was in 1889, Douglas to Haiti and Clark to Liberia. And by then, uh, Alexander Clark himself is known as the colored orator of the West. Next. 1849, Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church, uh, known as AME. The, the AME Church was founded here in Muscatine uh, with a building since, uh, located since 1850 near 7th and Orange Streets the site of today's New Jerusalem Church, uh, still a black congregation. Richard Harvey Kane serves as first pastor. After the Civil War, Kane serves two terms in the U.S. Congress from South Carolina. On the screen, we have a picture of Pastor Kane. Uh, later, he, when he was a bishop and he was a college president in the AME also. And uh, on the right, a picture of the Bethel AME Church uh, taken in 1952 with its congregation at the time. They call it Mother Bethel. One of the things we, we are unsure of at this point, but one of the topics uh, I'm going to be researching within the next couple of years is really more information about the AME Church, and in particular the AME uh, Church School, the educational system uh, that was established at the church for black students. Uh, we know relatively little of the information, and I'm hoping uh, within a short period of time that the black community of Muscatine, especially those who have, have been in Muscatine for, for many, many years, will be able to provide us additional information about the educational system. Ordinarily in many other communities, the black schools were considered to be um, uh, highly um, uh, educational and of high quality of, of education. Um, I'd like to find out if that's the case in Muscatine as well. I suspect because of Alexander Clark that is the case. It was a curious arrangement they had that the, yes. uh, the state said they were providing education to the black students and so at the expense of the church and not in the public school facility. Separate but They equal. had that separate, <laughs> absolutely not equal. Uh, let's go to our, our next slide. And in, in fact, Alexander Clark, we, we believe, was um, uh, funding the, uh, uh, the expense of a teacher uh, each year for a number of years. Well, in, uh, in 1851, Iowa outlaws black immigration uh, again. In 1852, Harriet Beecher Stowe publishes Uncle Tom's Cabin, which of course, it was published serially uh, in a chapter by chapter, and uh, 
it swept the country and popularized uh, the, the cause of the abolitionists, the underground railroad operators, and, uh, and really brought to public attention and public conscience uh, the, the situation of, of slaves in the South. Next. 1853, Orion Clemens, uh, Samuel Clemens, older brother by 10 years, lives in a small house at 109 Walnut Street uh, with their mother and brother Henry. I didn't word that very well. Uh, Sam Clemens was here too, at least part of that time uh, during 1854. Uh, you know, there are, there are a lot of stories about that, but the best we know is that he, he was here at most for a period of months. And uh, it wasn't all that long, but he did send dispatches back and his first published writings were in the Muscatine Journal. So uh, Brother Orion is co-editor and co-owner of the, well, first it was called the, the Bloomington Herald, uh, but then the Muscatine Journal with abolitionist John Mahon whose wife was raised a Quaker near West Branch, Iowa, and who himself had lived near Rochester, Iowa, just up uh, across the line in Cedar County, uh, had lived there as a boy. And uh, John Mahon came as an apprentice to the Muscatine Journal, uh, working under abolitionist editors in the late 1840s, and then became the editor, co-owner himself. And uh, they had interesting parallel careers. Alexander Clark for uh, 50 years here at Muscatine, uh, becoming increasingly influential, and likewise John Mayen, starting as an apprentice and eventually postmaster editor and, uh, my goodness, everything else. Many of you may be aware that on Walnut Street, uh, ne right next to the um, uh, S.M. McKibben house, uh, there is a marker that documents the Clemens house. I prefer to call it the Jane Clemens house, <laughs> Mrs. Clemens, and her two sons simply happened to live there. I suspect it was her house. And three sons part of the time. The three sons part of the time. The, uh, uh, the marker does give additional information about the Clemens family, and, and it's a story that we would like to, another story that we would like to spend more time playing with. It's curious to me, and, and uh, this is my personal take on a topic, uh, and there is no way of proving this, but it's curious to me that Alexander Clark dealt with Jim the White, the runaway slave, and many years later, uh, Samuel Clemens writes the story of Jim, the runaway slave, mm -hmm. when there's so many commonalities between the two story, stories. The, the, Aleg uh, the Samuel Clemens historians, of course, are going to say absolutely that did not happen. Uh, on the other hand, there's no way to prove it or disprove it, but it is a coincidence. Next slide. Uh, I don't know how much of this can show up on the screen. This is taken from a uh, microfilm of, of old newspapers from the 1850s, but again, we've got the caption, <coughs> Underground Railroad, 1854. And uh, what you see on the upper left is a facsimile of a long report uh, actually using the term Underground Railroad, an Underground Railroad adventure that appeared in the Muscatine newspaper uh, published by Clemens and, uh, and Mahon, and it was reported nationwide. And, and so the other image I have there is from the National Anti-Slavery Standard, a national newspaper uh, reprinted this story from the Muscatine Journal. Is this the article that, that uh, Mahon wrote that, that says uh, essentially that uh, Muscatine would not participate in the Underground Railroad, and that essentially people of intelligence would know nothing about that. I'm not sure if this is the <laughs> one or, or there are others. There, yeah, there was a, a curious humor we've learned in reading, reading the writings of these folks uh, who would uh, uh, often write with tongue in cheek. Next slide. Uh, 1854, Samuel Clemens, he's age 18. Oh, this is covering something I've already said. Comes to Muscatine for several months and works at the Herald uh, as a printer's devil or apprentice. And he hangs out at younger brother Henry's workplace, R.M. Burnett's bookstore on the river side of Second Street between Iowa and Chestnut. And as near as I can figure out, that's where there's a parking lot now. If you go to the Muscatine mm. History and Industry Center, the Button Museum there on the main floor, look across the street at the parking lot toward the river, uh, that's where Mark Twain used to spend his time in Muscatine. And don't you think, even though Samuel Clemens was only here for, for perhaps three, three months, that uh, he might have gotten a haircut? Two young men about the town? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure they must have known each other. They Next. lived in the same neighborhood, practically. Next slide. 18, oh, there, here we go. Th there's the picture you were talking about, right. Kanda. Right. A, little, a little more of it, I don't think, I, no. 
uh, the caption was centered, so I'm not sure I give us the entire image. But uh, it is significant that the Boston Weekly uh, Picture Magazine Blue's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion features Muscatine as Iowa's best landing point on the Mississippi River. And actually the text that accompanies this uh, artwork uh, is just rapturous about the, uh, how Iowa is the best city of the West. Best place to live, best place to live. And actually, going back to the Iowa band, as I remember, one of the reasons that A.B. Robbins and his wife settled in Muscatine was because uh, Muscatine was considered to be uh, more civilized and highly cultured. And I believe A.B. Uh, Robbins, Robbins made... Robbins was married, and a number of those other married. pastors were not. That's and they correct. Said, well, let him go to the civilized place. That's correct. So he, Muscatine was civilized. The population in 1855 was um, five or 6,000 people. That was larger than um, uh, St. Louis, or, or um, uh, not St. Louis, what am I thinking of? St. Louis and, Louis and uh, Fort Snelling. Fort Snelling became Minneapolis. Fort Snelling uh, the became same, The same Minneapolis. issue of Ballou's Pictorial has a feature on Kansas City, spelled right. with a Z. Right. And uh, I think that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, it was Mu Kansas Muscatine City. was larger than Kansas City much, at that much time. Much larger certainly. than Kansas City. Uh, next slide. 1855. Iowa's black residents. This is a remarkable document uh, held by the State Historical Society uh, Museum in Des Moines. Uh, Muscatine's black residents petitioned the Iowa legislature for repeal of that 18, 1851 exclusion law. And so there we have signatures of, uh, of about, uh, I believe it was about 30. I not, can't see on the screen. I believe it was about 30 who signed that petition. And this is another one of those uh, historical documents that we're trying to, or I've spent some time trying to determine who the, the signatures uh, actually belong to. Uh, I do know that, that Alexander Clark signed the document, Catherine Clark and Rebecca Clark all signed. Rebecca actually was young enough that she probably could not read or write. So in her case, there is simply an X, as there is for many of the people who signed the petition. Uh, the name was written, I believe, probably by Alexander Clark or Catherine Clark. Uh, and then right in the middle of the first name and last name, there is an X, which is the sign of the, for that particular person. Uh, in addition to Alexander Clark, uh, Thomas uh, Motts and his wife signed the petition. Uh, the Reverend um, Anderson and his wife signed the petition. And there are a number of names that we can't really determine for sure yet. Uh, but these were members of the AME Church of Muscatine. Next slide. 1857, Alexander Clark is quoted in the Muscatine Journal. Historian Robert Dykstra and other researchers, uh, and uh, there, more recently there have been uh, uh, David Broadnax and Leslie Schwalm and, and others who are, who are digging into these original documents and uh, uh, doing amazing research. Uh, they, they piece together the story and discover surprisingly much cooperation between Muscatine's community leaders, black and white, in the effort for fairness in state laws. Next. 1856, a school, we've talked about this, a school for black students is held in Muscatine at the AME Church and at the church's expense. Right. 1857, the state's first colored convention, as it was called, meets in Muscatine there at the AME Church. At least 33 delegates from various black communities petitioned the Constitutional Convention in session at Iowa City to repeal the exclusion law and provide state money for their schools. Uh, the, uh, the Constitutional Convention that gave us the 1857 Constitution we live under in Iowa today uh, was drafted in Iowa City with uh, 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 many of the state leaders from the time were from Muscatine, from Muscatine. or had lived here. Absolutely. And uh, so that petition to the legislature and this further petition to the Constitutional Convention uh, there was a lot of uh, a lot of uh, influence and uh, pressure from Muscatine, and I think again it would be interesting to compare all of the population information we have for that period of time because I believe Muscatine was the largest community along the Mississippi uh, or on the uh, southeastern part of, of Iowa. Uh, it would make sense that that if we were the largest community, that we probably had the largest influence on on the uh, establishment of the Constitution. And, and I don't have a slide, and I don't have the numbers at hand, but. In the 1850s, uh, during this period, Iowa had the largest Afri uh, Muscatine had the largest African American population in Iowa. Dubuque uh, had a, a larger population very early, but uh, the, 
the racist, the discriminatory uh, uh, environment there uh, led to led it to decline. And later, uh, Keokuk, uh, by, by the 1860s, the time of the Civil War, Keokuk has become the largest black population. But at the time of the uh, Constitutional Convention, it was, Muscatine was the black capital. That is correct. The center of black community. Next slide. And uh, actually, I, I, had, uh, I had two or three here about the Constitutional Convention. This is some text from that Dykstra history book I was speaking of. And uh, the full quote is, in December, uh, Alexander Clark and other local, December 1856, uh, just before the convention convened, Alexander Clark and other local activists collected 122 signatures uh, of Muscatine folks, black and white. Uh, the state has, is looking for that petition, Actually. and so far we haven't seen it. But that's the record we have. Next slide. Uh, Mr. Parvin, uh, he was uh, from Muscatine, or had been from Muscatine, presented uh, the, uh, this, is a, this is a quote, uh, it's about that same petition, I think, uh, Henry O'Connor, his name will come up again, and 190 others, against insertion in the Constitution of a provision, of a provision not permitting colored persons to hold property, testify in court, etc. Uh, there, uh, there was an attempt there to get to, that exclusionary language out entirely. Next slide. Uh, Kent, here's where I have the pictures of the various right, versions right. of the Congregational Church. Uh, I, I highlighted the expression, all abolitionists, because Pastor A.B. Robbins, uh, whose uh, portrait we see there, uh, who came in 1843 and, and was here till his death in the 1890s, uh, at one time claimed that all the members of the congregation were abolitionists. Now that may, uh, what congregation have you ever known where the parishioners, uh, the members, all did what the pastor instructed or claimed of them? But wasn't that the outcome of the, the convention, the congregational convention that they had in 57, uh, 58? There, there was, in, in 57 there was a situation actually where a black woman applied for membership in the congregation. No, we that. know she was turned down with right. the instruction that she could do more good with her own people or something to that effect. In 1859, uh, at, let's, put the, uh, let's put the picture of the church buildings back on the screen. The, the one on the lower right is the one folks today will recognize as the pro hair uh, salon. Uh, without the belfry, that building still exists, uh, looking very much like that. And uh, at that building in 1859, there was a statewide convention of Congregationalists, and there it was that they adopted a resolution for the first time going on record against the National Fugitive Slave Law and in favor of folks who were doing underground railroad type activities, working in anti-slavery societies uh, and, and suffering consequences for that. Um, Kent, let's say something about these other buildings too. Um, go right ahead. I'm thinking of another topic. Go ahead. Oh, okay. The, 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 little, the little building you see on the left was actually located at the corner of 4th and Sycamore. That was the Congregationalists' first location. They built that, I believe, in 1844, maybe 45, I think 44. And uh, when that bell, we've already shown a picture of the, the bell that came by wagon from Boston. When it arrived, uh, it, was, it was too heavy for that building. They built a separate structure for it. Then in 1852, they built for the first time at the corner of West 3rd and Chestnut Streets. So the upper right, the building with the spire, is the first uh, building on that corner. And maybe you can, maybe you can even see how the land is, is drawn there. Uh, Kent mentioned the, how, what happened with the streets. In 1856, uh, West 3rd Street was graded down and it's told that the entrance to the church was left 12 feet above the street. Uh, it was a boom time, as we said. This was the, this was the place to be. It was, it was uh, population was growing rapidly, uh, immigrants arriving every day, and uh, it was a good time in the economy. The members of the congregation said, well, let's build bigger and better. So they used the bricks from the 1852 church. They literally tore it down, they met elsewhere, and constructed the building that we now have, the 1857 structure next door. And it was intended that that would be put to some other use later on uh, when they would build a bigger, finer church uh, on the corner in, in the space that today is a parking lot, but in fact uh, did have two more buildings later on. There are two thoughts that come to mind in looking at these, these uh, photographs. Number one, uh, I assume that most people in Muscatine uh, understand that the streets of Muscatine were graded down beginning in 1856. Uh, and I remember seeing a document, an engineering document at one point that belonged to the county, uh, as I remember, that showed Broadway at the top of West Hill having been graded down 18 feet 
you, you can begin to understand, and all of that, all of that earth was being moved into downtown Muscatine to, to fill up uh, uh, wetlands uh, so that downtown Muscatine could be constructed. Um, it certainly does explain why we have so many uh, uh, troublesome terraces in, in Muscatine. Um, a very good example of that at this point is, is looking at the, the uh, terrace of the Alexander Clark House on West 3rd Street, 207 uh, West 3rd Street, and following across the street to the new, now retaining walls that hold uh, earth out of the parking lot across the street. So that's one thought that comes to mind. There's another thought that comes to mind, and that, uh, this is out of uh, my curiosity. I would really like to have been a fly on the wall when the uh, black member of the AME Church applied to the Congregational Church <laughs> for, for uh, membership. Uh, since I believe so much of the work was uh, uh, a combination, cross-cultural in many respects, uh, the Reverend A.B. Robbins was a very good friend of the Clark family. Uh, Alexander Clark lived diagonally across from the street. Uh, this was a Congregationalist neighborhood, most of whom were abolitionists. Uh, you, you begin to wonder, what was the plan? What was the plan, or what waters were they testing? Uh, Later, in fact, black women, black men, black children were members of the Congregational Church. But at that period of time, I think something else was going on. And a, a number of the influential citizens of the community were members of that church. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to our next slide. 1857, back to uh, Dred Scott, the U.S. Supreme Court Dred Scott decision uh, right in the, as Iowa's Constitutional Convention was going on in Iowa City, the Dred Scott decision comes down, ruling that slaves and former slaves are not U.S. citizens and thus are not entitled to basic rights. Uh, so, so imagine uh, trying to create the Constitution of Iowa and having the Supreme Court say, oh, well, uh, uh, they aren't citizens, so uh, how could we possibly have a Constitution that uh, said otherwise might have been the reaction. Uh, Dred Scott lived with a Dr. Emerson at Fort Armstrong, which uh, was at Rock Island, the island in the river, uh, then, uh, then near Leclerc in Iowa Territory. Uh, Leclerc was more of a town than, than uh, any of the other Quad Cities as we know them today. Uh, and, then, uh, and then Dred Scott lived at Fort Snelling, as we've said, became Minneapolis. Later in 1857, uh, Iowans uh, are presented this new constitution that's been drafted, so Iowans ratify the new constitution uh, which does deny black suffrage, but does, does include some of the other rights. I learned two interesting things last weekend uh, when I was attending a, a presentation in uh, uh, Rock Island. Uh, there is uh, one descendant of Dredd and Harriet Scott alive in St. Louis. Her name is uh, Lynn Jackson, um, that Dred Scott married Harriet, I uh, don't know her maiden name, who was a freed black woman. And obviously that, because uh, Dred Scott was a slave, it led to certain uh, family problems for them. Um, the other thing is that Dred Scott actually had a, uh, a piece of ground that he was farming, uh, which is about where the Leclerc Bridge is now. And apparently there are now historical markers placed there for that. And there is now a book about Mrs. Dred Scott yes. by a scholar whose name slips my mind, uh, who's at the University of Iowa. Uh, uh, that, Leah Vander... There you Pelt. go. Yes. Vanderveld? Vander, Vanderveld, Vanderpelt, Vanderpelt. Leah Vanderpelt. Uh, let's go to the next slide before uh, the senior moments set in worse. Right. <laughs> uh, 1858. Now we're, now we're going to cut to some of the, uh, the activity by the white folks. Abolitionist John Brown's followers, uh, a group of men, spend January through March near Springdale in Cedar County. It's about five miles east of West Branch in uh, Cedar County, just north of here, training for their raid of the arsenal at Harper's Ferry, uh, Virginia, now West Virginia. Uh, and their, their dream, or John Brown's dream, was that they would spark a widespread revolt by slaves. And then in 1858-59, uh, Brown's group, and they're back in Kansas because uh, we don't have time to go into the whole uh, Civil War before the war that was happening in what was known as Bleeding Kansas. Uh, but uh, John Brown and company uh, raid a, nor now on here I said Northwest Missouri, I really, it's, it's Western Missouri, they were pretty far down the border, uh, raids a Western Missouri, two Western Missouri farms and takes slaves uh, to free Kansas. Kansas, uh, the fight was 
pretty much over by then in Kansas. The Free State forces were winning, and uh, they made it across the border and up uh, paralleling uh, the Mississippi or the Missouri River uh, to Nebraska, and uh, with uh, with pursuers behind them all the time into Iowa, and. Uh, it was uh, really an amazing journey of a couple of months duration across Iowa in the midst of a frigid, nasty winter. At West Liberty here in Muscatine County, uh, the freedom seekers, as uh, some people have taken to calling these uh, escaped uh, fugitive slaves, uh, are able to board a prearranged boxcar. The railroad had, uh, you may remember, had uh, come to the Quad Cities or come to uh, Rock Island in 1854. The bridge was completed in 1856 and uh, made, it to, uh, made it to Iowa City or a bit beyond by this point. And so uh, here at West Liberty, Iowa, they were able to get on a train. And this, this is a prearranged boxcar. There was a lot of arrangement that went into that and uh, a main part of the work was done by Josiah B. Grinnell, the founder of the town of Grinnell. We mentioned the Iowa College founded by the Iowa Band. J.B. Grinnell was another Congregationalist uh, who uh, had founded a town and a college. And he made a special trip to Chicago to arrange for that boxcar to be put on a sidetrack in, uh, in West Liberty. And uh, the folks got on there, eluded pursuers. Uh, there was concern at Davenport crossing the Mississippi River, but they, they succeeded in getting away and, and all the way to Canada. The state of Iowa, for uh, several years now, has been working on a project, uh, a, a heritage tourism project, if you will, called the John Brown Freedom Trail. And so the images we have on here uh, on the right hand, uh, lower right, you see the logo for the John Brown Freedom Trail Project. And on the left, uh, the map, and there, are, there were 16 uh, different, uh, I believe it's 16 different sites, correct me Ken if I'm wrong, across the state on this trail, uh, different places where the party uh, stayed during that two month period. And the state has erected historical markers at these places and the, the map shows you stop by stop and tells the story. Yeah, just a very quick comment. Uh, there's, there's, I believe, uh, little reason to think that Alexander Clark did, was not familiar with uh, uh, John Brown. John Brown uh, spoke in Tipton, spoke in uh, Mount Pleasant, uh, was in Iowa City with the uh, boxcar taking slaves, uh, freed slaves to Chicago. Uh, Alexander Clark was traveling a great de deal during that period of time. Remember, he he traveled back and forth to Iowa City frequently. Uh, would not have met Catherine had he not done that. His wife. And there are uh, five trips by John Brown document back and forth across Iowa. We have not found specific information that uh, Alexander Clark uh, knew John Brown, but I'm highly suspicious. Uh, I think it's more li more likely he did than he did not. And just a comment: uh, we need to watch our time because. We've got 40 years to go and there's only 10 minutes left. We may have to do another show. <laughs> well, let's go to another slide. 1859, John Brown and six others are hanged for treason after attacking the federal arsenal at Harper's, Prairie, uh, Harper's Ferry. Uh, 1860, Iowa Governor Samuel Kirkwood resists Virgin state of Virginia, tries to extradite uh, Barclay Coppock, a, a Quaker man from Cedar County, and uh, Governor Kirkwood resists. Next slide. And I, I mentioned the, the idea of heritage tourism. The image here is uh, from the Interstate 80 rest area uh, just north of Muscatine, uh, the eastbound exit to where you would get off to come to Muscatine on Iowa Highway 38. There is a rest area there. The entire theme is uh, Underground Railroad and uh, many, many images, a number of them wrong, but in any case. A number of them wrong. Uh, in any case. It's there. There's a tourism interest. Next slide. 1861 to 65, the Civil War, obviously could it be its own show. Ken Burns has done that. We're gonna pass through here very quickly, uh, but uh, simply to mention the image here shows us from 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation, Abraham Lincoln declaring that the slaves would be free. Actually, he freed the slaves in the Confederate states, in the uh, enemy territory, if you will, but not in the Northern states. And it was not until after the war that, uh, that slavery really ended in this country. And many people forget the fact that, that wealthy black families had slaves, and that also Native Americans who could afford slaves had slaves. It, it, it took years for slavery to uh, uh, actually be abolished uh, entirely. And the reality is it is still not abolished to this day. Let's go to our next slide. Uh, th this is just 
pulled out from an advertisement in the local newspaper. I gave it the headline, Promin Prominent Citizen, 1862. Uh, interestingly, adjacent ads, Dr. D.P. Johnson lived directly across West 3rd Street. The, the house doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but uh, D.P. Johnson was a doctor who practiced, again, with a, a career very much parallel to Alexander Clark and John, John Mann and, and Alden Burrell. Mm -hmm. uh, same long career in Muscatine. He did leave during the Civil War. He was a surgeon for the 11th Iowa Infantry, which uh, the men came largely from Muscatine County. And then directly below D.P. Johnson's uh, medical doctor ad, you see Alexander Clark advertising fashionable hairdressing, shaving, and shampooing, saloon. And, uh, I can't read the rest of that text very well, but maybe folks watching television can. Next slide. Alexander Clark at the same time was campaigning for creation of, uh, or for the opportunity for black men to serve in the war. And uh, there, there was a lot of controversy about this, but historians look back and say, you know, if Abraham Lincoln hadn't decided that there would be uh, black armed forces, uh, things might have gone the other way. Alexander Clark, with support from Iowa Governor Kirkwood, uh, was the, one of the founders of the first Iowa Volunteers of African descent, later named the 60th uh, U.S. Uh, Colored Troops. Their, their unit flag, which is um, uh, the uh, right-hand photographs, is, is one of the most beautiful flags that the State Historical Society of Iowa possesses. It was made by women in Keokuk and Muscatine and presented by Alexander Clark to the Iowa First in St. Louis. Uh, unfortunately, as you can see in the lower colored photograph, restoration during the, um, um, during the bicentennial almost destroyed the flag. Uh, that is a silk flag and a chemical was used to clean it and it destroyed the silk fiber. Hmm. Um, however, it's still the most beautiful flag in the collection. Next slide. 1865, the, the war's over. The 13th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution abolishes slavery throughout the United States. Uh, also in 1865, Alexander Clark is elected president of a convention of about 700 African American Civil War veterans, many of them from Iowa, seeking the right to vote. That was held at Davenport, and uh, I titled this slide Post-War Optimism. There was a feeling uh, we have served our country and uh, we have uh, earned the right to some rights. Next slide. 1867, uh, Frederick Douglass, you remember the, uh, the, the great colored orator from the East, um, is on a speaking tour. He speaks in eastern Iowa. We have not found a record of him being in Muscatine, but as, uh, as you recall, he's known Alexander Clark since 1853, and there is a, uh, a well-documented report of his uh, speech in Iowa City. Also, later that year, Susan Clark, age 12, Alexander's daughter, is denied admission to grammar school number two at the corner of West 3rd and Spruce Street, ju just up the street from their family home, and her father sues on her behalf. Remember, the, the school she was attending was the African school way over at 7th and Orange. And uh, again, we're looking at this case because uh, the Clark versus Muscatine schools may be what the Alexander Clark and family are best known for. Uh, 1868, the Supreme Court of Iowa rules in favor of Susan Clark, granting all children of Iowa the right to attend common schools. And we like to point out, 86 years ahead of the U.S. law, you know, the Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, again, one of the interesting things that I find about this case are the people who were, who were involved with Alexander Clark and Susan in, in pursuing the, um, uh, the case in the Supreme Court decision. Uh, the attorneys for, uh, pr first of all, Alexander Clark uh, filed the suit uh, as next best friend of Susan Clark, his daughter. The attorneys were uh, Jerome Karskadden and D.C. Richmond. When this lawsuit first went to district court, it was trialed before J. Scott Richmond. And coincidentally enough, the, um, uh, the principal of the high school uh, at the time was Irving B. Richmond. So a number of people from the same Father, family. Father, son, and uncle. <laughs> Father, son, and uncle. The history of education that Irving B. Richmond wrote indicates that for a period of several months, he, was, he asked to be replaced. So I assume it may well have happened during this lawsuit period. Next slide. 1868, the 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution overrules the Dred Scott decision, finally, and requires states to provide equal protection under the law. 1868, 
Iowa amends the state constitution, becoming the first state outside New England allowing blacks to vote and serve on juries. And uh, there, we, there we have a picture of the uh, many times that the word white was struck from that 1857 constitution. Next slide. 1871, Susan Clark becomes the first black graduate of Muscatine High School, uh, which uh, at that time was at the corner of 3rd and Iowa, uh, just a block down the street from her home. Uh, and as Kent mentioned before, the building that was the Scott Hotel then and the Welch Apartments today. Uh, she was probably the first black student to graduate from a public high school in Iowa. One of the curiosities of this, again, is that you know, it's difficult to know uh, where Susan attended uh, the, her school year before she actually won the Supreme Court decision. Um, and she had, would have completed all of the grades of the AME uh, church school. Uh, and during this period of time, for reasons that I'm not quite sure, the first year of high school was uh, placed back into middle school. So although Susan Clark had completed middle school, was applying for the high school, she would, by virtue of the change of the uh, educational system, um, her application to high school was postponed by one year. Several years later, of course, the high school went back to being a four-year school. Let's race through some of the rest of this I think history. we have to. Next slide. Uh, this is a, an excerpt, and I'm, we're not going to take time for this, but uh, Alexander Clark, known as the great colored orator of the West, uh, and here we have an excerpt from his centennial address that he, probably like a stump speech, that he presented in a number of places. This is a record from his presentation of it in, in uh, Oskaloosa, Iowa in 1876. We know that he also represented African Americans at the United States Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia that year. Uh, it, was a, it was an election year and he was traveling all around the country by then uh, campaigning for uh, President Ulysses Grant for his re-election. And by the way, I didn't have a slide about it, but President Grant in 1862 or 72, 73 uh, actually offered Alexander Clark appointment as ambassador to Haiti, which Alexander Clark declined. Next slide. Uh, 1875, bird's eye view of Muscatine in the Andreas Atlas of Iowa, and you see a, a little snippet of that here. 1876, Alexander Clark campaigns for Grant's re-election, as I said, and, uh, and was at the Centennial Exposition. Next slide. Uh, 1878, the first published biography we have uh, appears uh, in, in this uh, portrait gallery of eminent, biographical dictionary and portrait gallery of eminent and self-made men. Uh, signed there, fraternally yours, Alexander Clark. We haven't talked about uh, Grand Master. We haven't talked about the fact that he, and this is a story in itself, that uh, he was a leader of the Black Masons, the Masonic movement, the Prince Hall Masons, uh, learned under his uncle in Cincinnati before he even arrived. His uncle was a pioneer bringing it to the West and Alexander likewise by this time was the Grand Master we understand for an area that was at least five states. Next slide. 1877, Alexander Clark's house, that original house at West Third and Chestnut, Wooden House, burns down. Arson is suspected. He rebuilds with brick in 1878. Uh, Kent is the restorer, resident, owner of that house and Kent you say that he sure did re he sure did rebuild with brick. Well, I, I, I suspect that the, the fire actually started on the uphill side at the back of the house. Um, the red brick house that, that I own and restored uh, seems to be an exact duplicate of the frame house that was burned. The, and, and I finally realized one day why the uh, doors and the hallways were so narrow. The new house, the red brick house, is solid brick. It's a solid masonry structure, probably the same um, outside dimensions as the frame house. And in order to make the rooms approximately the same size and to accommodate the extra width of all of the building material, doors and hallways were made narrower. Uh, it, uh, the other interesting fact is, and the reason I believe that the fire started on the uphill side at the back of the house, is that when I go through the back door of my house, there are three firewalls before ever getting into the main side of the house. Three 10-inch huh. solid masonry walls. Let's return to that same slide. 
so um, 1879, Alexander Clark Jr., uh, we haven't spoken about him, but he, he also graduated from Muscatine High School following his sister. Alexander Clark Jr. becomes the first black person to graduate from the University of Iowa with a law degree. 1882, Alexander Clark uh, Sr. Purchases, purchases a Chicago newspaper with his son. And, uh, and by the way, son Alexander Jr. had also worked at the Muscatine Journal a block from home as a compositor. Uh, so together they purchased this newspaper in Chicago with Ferdinand L. Barnett uh, and Alexander is editor of The Conservator until 1887. Uh, interestingly, in 1895, Ferdinand Barnett, uh, Alexander's former partner, marries Ida B. Wells, who has come up from the South to Chicago, and uh, she's already made a name for herself as the person who popularized the whole problem of lynching that had started up after the Civil War. And uh, he marries her and then she takes over and becomes the editor of The Conservator and eventually Ida B. Wells Barnett is known as a founder of the National Association for Advancement of Colored People and any number of other achievements. Interesting connection. Uh, 1884, Alexander Clark Sr. becomes the second, Sr., the father, becomes the second black person to graduate from the U University of Iowa with a law degree. Next slide. Uh, this. Uh, maybe not an image you can see well on the television, but the Muscatine Art Center in its collection holds this original letter of appointment uh, signed by, uh, in the handwriting of President Benjamin Harrison, accrediting Mr. Alexander Clark as Minister Resident and Consul General of the U.S. in Liberia. That appointment was in the fall of 1890. Next slide. Uh, I'm going to skip over this, but here, here is another example of the, uh, the oratory of uh, Alexander Clark as he was a newspaper editor. It's titled A Fearless Pen, as uh, he was described as wielding. Next slide. 1890, President Harrison appoints Clark to uh, ambassador to Liberia, and at the same time as I mentioned, Frederick Douglass, he appoints minister to Haiti. 1891, Alexander Clark dies in Liberia. Uh, he, he died of a fever, and we have uh, some reports on that. It's, it's curious. He knew he was taking a chance. Uh, it was really the crowning achievement of a life and maybe he, uh, maybe he didn't expect to come back. We don't know about that. He was sent off. The uh, uh, black, resident, black and white residents both uh, celebrated his appointment and his departure and uh, w there was a, a lot of fanfare and so uh, again he was eulogized and celebrated when his body came back in February 1892. He was eulogized as a leader for the right for liberty and for freedom, he can better be understood when you study him as one of the Underground Railroad engineers and conductors whose field was the South, whose depot was the North, and whose freight was human souls. And Kent, the last item I've put here in the timeline is 1896, the United States Supreme Court upholds the Jim Crow laws legalizing separate but equal all the until way until the, the 1960s. 1960s. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. There's so much more that we could actually be talking about that, that uh, I think people would find of interest. And maybe one of these days we will do another program. We really could talk about the, the whole moving of the house. Let's just flip through the slides and see the pictures well, quickly. Well, but Guys. let me, let me okay, go, go on from there. I mean, we haven't talked really much about Alexander Clark's uh, involvement with Prince Hall uh, Masonic Orders, uh, which is a huge issue. Uh, we haven't talked about his friends, friendship with Robert Lincoln in London. We haven't talked about Alexander Clark's participation in the uh, International Ecumenical uh, Church uh, Conference, Conference in London. In London. Yeah. There, there are thousands of pieces of information that we're, we're attempting to um, uh, organize and uh, put into some sort of a cohesive framework. Another example is who really was Alexander Clark? Where he was born in Washington, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, who was his family? Uh, were they slaves? Were they free? Well, I, I can tell you without a doubt that they were free. My, my brother and I have traced um, Alexander Clark's maternal grandfather back to 1798 when he purchased his first piece of property in uh, Washington, Pennsylvania. Uh, he was, and he was born in Virginia. We don't know whether he's a free man, but truly an illustrious family that did gain wealth and uh, lived their lives as, as people who supported uh, educational institutions, church institutions, fraternal organizations, and had a reputation as being philanthropists. Alexander Clark clearly was not a poor man. He was very well trained to do the work that he did. Uh, many of his friends were, were uh, um, activists exactly like he was. 
And interestingly, and I'll pass this along, I'd like to know more about uh, Alexander Clark's potential friendship with um, um, Peter Humphreys Clark. Peter Humphreys Clark lived in Cincinnati, and Peter Humphreys Clark was the son of William Clark of Lewis and Clark fame. He was a uh, uh, mulatto. Uh, all of these connections become, uh, um, they seem tangential, but what happens over a period of time is it starts to weave a very, very interesting fabric, a story uh, about a man that we really still don't know much about. Uh, we'll keep going and uh, we'll tell you bits and pieces as we get it, um, but certainly thank you for joining us. This has been fun. Let's, uh, can we do a, just a montage? You can if you'd like, of course. Uh, let's, uh, guys, let's, let's do these slides three or four seconds each, and if Kent wants to comment on any of them, uh, otherwise we'll just let them go by. Oh, Aldine Davis. Big help in the project. Cemetery Stone. The house was almost demolished. The house was almost demolished. Elizabeth Verhusen, who did a great deal of research on the Alexander Clark House. This is the uh, moving the house. The house was moved up the street about 200 feet. Yeah. Aldine Davis is in that picture. This is a Des Moines Sunday Register feature just a couple of years ago that really helped bring new attention back to Alexander Clark. Stephen Fries, who won the National History Day Award uh, for his paper on Alexander Clark, and also the Governor's Award for the state of Iowa. People visiting the memorial, the family uh, stone in Greenwood Cemetery, which has deteriorated. On one of these days, we'd like to replace it with a replica and, and protect the original. There's a photograph of Stephen and me. Eternally yours. And the house as it is today. Okay. Hey, thanks for joining us. We'll uh, hopefully do this another time. Hope you've enjoyed it. If you would like to read Stephen Fries's entire paper, you can download that from the Alexander Clark website. Uh, uh, Dan is the uh, webmaster for that site. And it's alexanderclark.org. Alexander Clark, all one word. Uh, Stephen's paper is available. I will tell you it was restricted in its length, so it really is the footnotes and the annotated bibliography which are, are the most spectacular. Thank you.